Okay, greetings. Welcome to the first American Gothic lecture. I just wanted to begin before we get into the actual texts to describe uh, a little bit of the landscape of North America, which I think comes uh, into play or figures prominently in early American, strictly American Gothic literature. Um, and of course, it figures strongly in Wieland and others. But I think uh, one of the contrasts between European or English Gothic and American Gothic starts here at this uh, experience of the wilderness. If you recall, um, America, as you know, it's pretty obvious, was pretty much uncharted uh, and a wilderness. There were tiny little settlements only on the coast for the first hundred or so years uh, of the English colonists' uh, colonization of the New World. And the rest of the land was uncharted, unknown. It was a uh, mysterious land, unlike the place that the settlers came from, those who came from England, because it's also dangerous and um, this new land, un, uh, uncircumscribed, untamed, uh, unknown. Um, and the the grandeur of the landscape and the vastness of it inspired the imagination of those early settlers. Um, they were not accustomed to these kinds of wide open spaces uh, in the land that from which they had come. So early on in the uh, whatever kind of passes for Gothic literature in North America, uh, you see the wilderness figuring very strongly or prominently. So this is from the trial of uh, the Salem witch trials here, the trial of GB by Cotton Mather. Um, so this depiction of a, an abduction, as it were, by this conjurer reads something like this. Sound of trumpets summoning of the other witches who quickly after the sound would come from all quarters unto the rendezvous, one of them falling into a kind of trance, affirmed that the conjurer had carried her away into a very high mountain where he showed her mighty and glorious kingdoms and said he would give them all to her if she would write in his book but she told them that they were none of his to give and refused the motions, enduring of much misery for that refusal. So he carries her to mountains uh, and then he gives her this kind of temptation that is probably familiar from in the Bible. Um, these early colonial tales reveal patterns to be seen again in American Gothic. The setting is not a haunted castle, but a wilderness, that repository of so many complex and contradictory American values. One of the uh, enduring images we get in uh, the early experience of these col colonists in the wilderness is that of the abduction narrative. And these go back to the 17th century with things like the narrative of Hannah Dunstan. And of course, these could be uh, fairly accurate depictions of a person's experience being abducted by indigenous peoples in North America. They, of course, could be embellished and sometimes were, but these were also considered Gothic narratives uh, because, again, you have kind of uh, a woman facing dangers a plight, uh, unknown mystery, uh, the, the the wilderness in this case. Um, it gets a little gory, as you can tell. The wilderness in, in America, North America, has a certain quality in these tales that, of course, this is somewhat of a joke and a meme, but that it lacks in in the European imagination. So on the left here, you get this kind of, you know, very wholesome, cuddly, cute depiction of forest creatures and rabbits. Um, but it doesn't have the kind of eerie, uncanny, unsettling, uh, almost diabolical, Lovecraftian uh, 
characteristics that the American North American forest on the right uh, connotes. So this is a Lovecraftian image, and then we get the same kind of imagery seen of a Maryland wilderness from the Blair Witch Project, 1999. Okay, so um, you get the idea, but I think this uh, this contrast has some philosophical underpinnings and it goes back to a, a bit of a a debate between philosophers Jean-Jacques Rousseau on the one hand and Hobbes on the other and their view of nature. Uh, Rousseau believed that nature was basically good. He believed that people in the state of nature were innocent and they were at their best when they were in their state of nature because they were uncorru uncorrupted by the unnaturalness of civilization. So Rousseau, someone like Rousseau would say that uh, civilization was a corruption. And you could see that he, you know, he frequented the urban centers of Europe and he probably saw quite a bit of corruption in those centers during that time period. Writing a little bit earlier, Hobbes famously wrote that the state of nature, our natural condition, is outside authority or political, a political state is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And he's famous for coining the Latin phrase, bellum omnium contra omnis. I don't know if he actually coined that term or if he just adapted it from classical sources, but basically it means the war of all against all. In other words, civilization, uh, human agency, human artifice, uh, governments are the only way that kind of keeps the, the, the forces of competition that you see in the animal kingdom from kind of infecting humanity and making us all into savage beasts with no sense of law or propriety. So you see Hobbes had a kind of the opposite view of Rousseau where uh, Rousseau thought that if we could all just get back to nature, we would live in tranquility and peace and harmony with nature, with each other. And he looked at civilization being the, the, the moment at which all this stuff was kind of compromised. Thomas Hobbes, on the other hand, uh, sees the origin of the problem as, as the opposite case, that, um, that the origin of the problem is our nature and that we need to get beyond or past our, our nature. And so the founding of America as a wilderness civilization wrought by discovery, violence, and conquest brings into sharp focus this tension between Hobbesian and the Rousseauian nature. So on the left, we see that's um, Walden Pond. Um, so we have the the inclination or the instinct of the transcendentalist thinkers and writers uh, like Thoreau and Emerson to get back into nature, to reclaim a lost innocence in nature. And then on the right, of course, one of these captive narratives uh, where out in nature is the chaos that, uh, that you can only uh, kind of lift yourself up from through civilization. And these two totally contrasted views on nature are very much brought into focus in this Gothic literature, the tension between civilization and nature and how both can lead, its, lead to its own problems. Okay, so uh, any questions so far before we get more into Brown? Okay, so uh, as we, as you know, um, Whelan starts off with this same kind of instinct of uh, a man, the elder Whelan, going out into nature and bringing religious fervor with him on the top of a rock whose sides were steep, rugged, and encumbered with dwarf cedars and stony asperities. A precipice was 60 feet above the river which flowed at its foot, fluctuating and rippling in a rocky channel. The edifice was slight and airy, 
It was no more than a circular area, 12 feet in diameter, whose flooring was the rock cleared of moss and shrubs and exactly leveled by 12 Tuscan columns um, and topped by an undulating dome. It was without seat table or ornament of any kind. This was the temple of his deity. Twice in 24 hours, he repaired hither unaccompanied by human being, nothing but physical inability to move was allowed to obstruct uh, this visit. Notice, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, though a lot of re religious fervor is kind of documented in Wieland. I, I don't think he ever um, actually mentions Jesus or Christianity in the book. Um, and the way the temple is described, it almost seems like a, a pagan place or a uh, a place of almost nature worship to a certain extent. I, um, I someone else might want to might want to chime in on that. Um, how I mean, it talks about how uh, the Elder Whelan had origins in kind of Calvinist doctrines and Anabaptists and stuff from the continent where he came from. But once he got out into the wilderness, this refuge that he builds is a very natural sanctuary type place that I don't think um, it's not like he's out preaching a, a particular sermon from from the, the Bible or anything. It just seems more of a place to reflect on nature. Um, and in that sense, he maybe presages the transcendentalism that would be kind of coming into that part of the country in the coming decades. So if you recall transcendentalism, was a tendency where people in nature are good and pure, but society, technology, and civilization corrupt them. Okay, hence a Rousseau uh, angle on, on the issue. Uh, people should be independent and self-reliant. We get in trans transcendentalism. And so you can see the Elder Wieland as somewhat of a uh, precursor or uh, someone who has that same tendency of self-reliant transcendentalism. Um, and then insight comes from subjective emotion and intuition instead of devotion to empiricism or scripture or the enlightened sages and philosoph philosophers of the past. Obviously, in this particular case, the Whelans, both father and son and the whole family, uh, Clara as well, um, they, they're not necessarily uh, transcendentalists in that sense. They... Uh, tend to uh, be fairly empirical in the things they, or, well, there, let's just say there's a, a, a bit of a, that's one of the tensions in the novel between subjective emotion and empiricism. Okay, but needless to say that that sense of English puritanism that brought the settlers into North America to begin with from Northern Europe for the most part, uh, is evident in the Whelan's um, act, this coming into the new world, this act to purify, to get past um, all the doctrines and dogmas of uh, you know, the history. It's a very, not just puritanical, but just basically a, a, a Protestant American um, tendency that you see a, a lot. This puritanical moving into the wilderness, the stripping away of society for the pursuit of single-minded devotion and spiritual edification finds its parallel in the actions of the Elder Wieland. So he's, he's part of that movement of the um, Puritans. What is the result of the Elder Wieland's devotion? And that's actually a question to you guys. What's the result of the Elder Wieland's devotion? Anyone? Does it work out for him? Okay, uh, he spontaneously combusts. Are there parall parallels between the results of the Elder Whelan's devotion and that of the sun? Just keep that in mind. Of course, you know, but we'll come back to that. Yes, he combusts. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so just keep these questions in mind as we, as we um, continue. So Carl Brockton Brown, a lot of his, you know, we're looking at Wieland. He also wrote uh, several short stories and other novels um, 
that play with many of these th same themes. He wrote one called Somnambulism, which I find interesting. I actually wrote a book on insomnia. So it's about sleepwalking and uh, it's about sleepwalking into the wilderness and much like in Wheeland, you find a murderer who loses control of the uh, of his senses uh, and his will and the the distinction between the real and the, un and the unreal and he's out in nature and he ends up committing murder. Um, so these so between spontaneous combustion combustion and ventriloquism and somnambulism, uh, Mr. Brown uh, seemed to have a, a wide range of interests, all of which point to this kind of this kind of uh, ambiguity of will and willpower um, and sensation. Um, Brown explores the point of tension between a fading 18th century rationalism and nascent 19th century non-rational individualism, as well as the tension between blind faith and the empiricism of sensory perception. In Brown's world, both sides and each of these oppositional tendencies are equally fraught with problems. All are subject to deceptions, delusions, and dangers. So Wieland, explores the reliability of judgment and sense perception and on the origin of evil and the ground of moral legal accountability. Uh, the younger Wieland ends up saying, I, from, I am free from all stain. If a devil deceived me, he came in the habit of an angel. If I erred, it was not my judgment that deceived me, but my senses. Now this this issue of whether or not you're responsible for your actions if your senses deceive you um, was quite a contemporary issue that had been recently pointed out just five years prior to the publication of Wieland by Immanuel Kant. And I think it's worth looking at that because uh, it, um, it is interesting that how Brown takes some of these same issues and uh, plays with them in interesting ways. So if you'll bear with me for a second, I'm just gonna this topic of um, whether, whether or not we can be held accountable for sin if it's part of God's instructions. So that's exactly what Wieland's saying, like I'm blameless because I thought the, these were God's instructions. How can you blame me for following God's instructions? So Kant uh, has, uh, describes animal instincts. And he says that animal instincts are the voice of God for animals, which they obey in a kind of prelapsarian state. For Kant, natural inclinations considered in themselves are good. So in other words, animals can't sin for Kant. Yet the Kantian man is a different creature altogether He's a composite creature. Our fall begins the moment when, as Kant says, the human being begins to use his reason. This meeting ground of reason and instinct, more than the meeting ground of instinct and society, as it was for Rousseau, becomes Kant's most consistently cited origin of evil. This collision of our reasoning faculty with an inherently good animal nature creates evil. Because our reasoning faculty is guided by our free will, we are held. We are held accountable. I don't know what that was. Loud sound. Excuse me. We are held accountable for our decisions and actions. A perceived lack of such accountability led Kant to reject the Augustinian reading of Genesis. For Kant, the biblical fall fails to describe an evil for which we could be held responsible, where Adam is already in full command of the use of his reason. Thus, Adam's evil propensity would have would had to be created in him. Therefore, his sin is set forth as engendered directly from innocence. In other words, if the biblical God created Adam and Eve with an innate propensity to do evil, they would have no free will to choose it. They would remain just as the Kantian animal, obedient to God's instructions and therefore unaccountable for anything. Kant thus sees the myth of Eve and Adam's temptation as a kind of explanation of how difficult it is to explain how sin can arise 
from a good nature and yet be accounted for by man. The story of Eve and Adam contains for us no conceivable ground from which the moral evil in us could originally have come. So this question of free will is also found in the, the act of ventriloquism itself that is Carwin's kind of gift and his special ability. So as Cambridge professor Stephen Connor says, although there are hints in the novel of demonic explanations for Carwin's gift, these are largely metaphorical and atmospheric. The novel insists not on the demonic aspect of the voice, but on its power to create spatial illusions. This may give the appearance of rationalizing the power of ventriloquism, but the literalization of the spiritual powers of the ventriloquist is itself an instance of magical thinking, since the belief that the ventriloquist has the actual power to exceed and counter man's spatial limits reproduces rather than refuses previous magical beliefs about demonic, demonic agency. Carwin speaks of his ventriloquo ventriloquial powers as a potent and stupendous endowment and identifies it with the immeasurable powers of the will. I made this powerful engine subservient to my will, to the supply of my wants, says Carwin. So the big question of the novel that Clara focuses on is, you know, who to blame for this? And, you know, Carwin wants to say that he is blameless um, and actually, uh, the younger Wheeland wants to say that he is also blameless. Um, have we have we come up with any kind of uh, consensus as a group on whom to ascribe blame for these murders? Does anyone want to chime in on uh, the issue of blame, or is it? No, oh, go ahead, Cheryl. I guess I saw that. Um... Wieland Theodore is more responsible in the sense that, you know, it seems like more of a case of insanity, but I think it seemed that uh, what Brown was trying to tell us was that they're both responsible for the issues of reason. Playel also struggles with being able to um, see things clearly. So it, was, it just seems like his intention was to say that there's blame all the way around because everyone is, um, subject to either religion, the fanaticism that we see in Wieland, in Pleyel's case, he's responsible for his judgment of Clara, not for the murders, of course, but then um, Carwin is responsible to some degree because he was intentionally um, trying to do harm, maybe not the harm that he actually, that ultimately happened. Yeah, that, that's good. That's interesting. But uh, yeah, I, I don't think, um... The novel, uh, it, it's very ambiguous and I think intentionally so. Um, I don't think you can chalk it up to necessarily to um, the younger Wieland, Theodore's insanity necessarily simply because um, within the parameters of his devoutness, he acted actually rationally. Like he acted according to what he thought was real. Um, but he was deceived. Um, and, you know, and again, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to put a final word on this. I think it is intentionally vague. And I don't think uh, one can necessarily ever have the last word on, on this question. But I think that itself is intentional, the intention of Brown, um, because I think he wanted to kind of cause trouble for people who believe to certain too certainly uh, that uh, between these two camps, uh, the, the believers and the faithful on the one hand who always just wanted to put their faith in, in God, and then the more kind of materialist um, empiricists on the other who trusted their senses. And Brown obviously seemed to be saying that uh, a plague on both your houses and that you can never trust 
that you know anything that you receive, whether you think you have you ascribe to a divine origin or otherwise, um, you you can never quite trust your senses. There are no kind of human rad, radical empiricisms to uh, to kind of pin all your hopes on and uh, avoid deception in, in the world of of particulars and where especially where people like Carwin uh, are walking around and as the quote on the screen right now indicates he's just kind of he's just kind of an asshole out there looking to deceive people for his own his own enjoyment um, that, that guy like he seems an interesting character but at the same time um, you know he's just trying to mess with people like kind of a it's like a Loki or a you know a trickster like a um, anyway, so uh, Brent says, in my view, Carwin is to blame overall because even though he meant no ill will for his ventriloquism act, he was a catalyst for Wheeling committing the horrific acts. Yeah, that kind of um, kind of segues or uh, dovetails a little bit with what I was saying that, you know, because he is the agent that put these wheels into motion, um, or presumably, that, uh, you know, you have to ultimately give at least some of the blame to him even though he he didn't kind of complete the circle or you know he didn't literally murder anyone he just kind of messed with people's minds so blame all around very good academics have focused on uh the idea of ventriloquism as this kind of act of oratory that befits the environment of, of the nation that was coming into being right when Brown was uh, writing this piece. So Brown thought that ventriloquism encoded urgent political problems and questions. It allows the speaker to manipulate space and take possession of it in a way that was befitting for Brown's newly independent country. The Declaration of Independence must be seen as a particular kind of a rhetorical performance for it not only declares independence, it also performs the independence of declaration itself. It is a declaration of will. And uh, as you might have read, when Whelan finished this novel, he actually sent it to uh, Thomas Jefferson. In ventriloquism, the ventriloquial throwing, uh, throwing of the self into the voice is extended to, sorry, is extended to the throwing of the voice outwards from the self so as to appear to have some other source. The Declaration of 1776 gives a voice or performs the giving of a voice to a nation that cannot speak in its own words. Nevertheless, the voice that is given to the nation declares that it is the voice of the nation speaking through the voice of the Declaration document itself. Sorry if this seems a little bit verbose, but this political ventriloquy thus involves recipro reciprocity and dynamically infinite regress in which both the nation and the voice that represents the nation declare that it speaks for and speaks through the voice of the other. Wieland is a warning against the dangers of rhetoric rhetoricity in such a culture founded upon oral performance and the authority of gesture and sensibility over truth and logic. If Wieland is in one sense a Gothic assault upon the ideals of truth and transparency associated with enlightenment political thinking, it is also a critique of the Gothic subordination of rationality to bodily sensation. So this is kind of what we were just talking about, that Brown is this interesting person who both presages kind of the gothic or the romantic subordination of rationality to bodily sensation um, that is coming online and will be will be pursued in the early 19th century among a lot of literary people um, and most of those people were looking askew uh, um, and condemning of rational uh, enlightenment political thinking or enlightenment empiricist or enlightenment thinking itself um, but brown here kind of again like i said is is a interesting puts himself in an interesting position in which, in which neither of these accounts 
entirely square or satisfy with the truth. Okay. Any questions on that? Does anyone want to tell me about Carwin's power over others as a testament to the power of the uncanny? If you recall what the uncanny was. Now recall the uncanny was a is a device uh, where something that seems at once familiar becomes suddenly unfamiliar, which is even eerier than something completely unfamiliar, I think sometimes. So if you see someone that you don't know, then that person is not, that can't, person can't really affect you that much because they're alien to you. What's even more alienating is you see someone you do know, but there's something about them that is off. <laughs> and that can be extremely off-putting because this is someone you know and trust and love, and yet they're corrupted somehow. Does that sound familiar? So what does Carwin do in order to put the wool over people's eyes and kind of take power over them? He mimics the voices of loved ones of the people involved oftentimes. So people will think that they are hearing each other, someone that they recognize. And in the case, the final case of Wieland, it's the voice of God. Um, so yes, Jack he uses doppelganger elements. You're right, like an, an auditory or aural doppelganger of a sort. Exactly, that's which is exactly what um, uh, ventriloquism is. Good. So moving to the turn of the screw, how does the governess's experience exemplify objection? I know one or two of you have actually written about this already. I don't know actually if they're here, but. The governess's experience exemplifying objection. Recall objection is the inability to determine whether something is interior or exterior or more accurately a subject object confusion. So is this a an objective experience or is this a subjective? Am I really seeing this or is this all in my mind basically? Um, and if you read closely the all through the turn of the screw you get hints that the narrator the governess in Turn of the Screw is not entirely um, trustworthy or a credible source for narration. And she does, or Henry James does leave clues that all of her visions may, I mean, she, he doesn't come right out and spell it, spell it out. I mean, again, just like Brown, it's a, it's hinted at, it's vague, it's ambiguous, but there are clues, subtle clues and hints that, uh, the visions she's having may be just figments of her imagination. And whether or not this is the case, it's never completely decided, obviously, but um, it keeps the, the curiosity peaked, I think, of the reader. So she says, I can't, I'd come out for my stroll. One of the thoughts that I, that, excuse me, one of the thoughts that, as I don't in the least shrink now from noting, used to be with me in these wanderings was that it would be as charming as charming story as a charming story suddenly to meet someone. So she's just kind of fantasizing about meeting someone. And then suddenly she does see someone. So what arrested me on the spot and with a shock much greater than any vision had allowed for was the sense that my imagination had in a flash turned real. He did stand there. So I don't think it's any accident or surprise the degree to which um, Turn of the Screw uh, plays with psychology and psychological matters um, and talks about kind of paranormal psychological experiences. Um, and as you may know, uh, the case is that um, Henry James was the younger brother of William James, who was a 
not only a famous American philosopher, but uh, a psychologist. And so the book Brothers shared along an abiding, abiding interest in psychology and Henry James's uh, novels usually are very psychological and the, the motives of the, the narrator or the principal protagonist usually are not, never entirely spelled out and they are always kind of, they leave m much room for doubt and a lot of introspection and a lot of questions about what this person's, what's going on in this person's psyche and their interiority, um, which again is kind of a calling card for William or Henry James's work. And I think his brother probably had a lot of influence in that regard. Um, okay. I think that about does it for now. We're coming on to an hour. Sorry for the one or two interruptions. Um, does anyone have any questions to um, kind of round out the hour? Um, and it could be questions about the class or the, or the material or the reading or anything at all. Questions? So you're good if we um, email potential thesis over to you. We, oh, that's, yes. yes. Okay, not, great. Not only am I good, I, I love it. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I would, I would demand it. I don't think I can demand it. Or I, I could, I guess I could require it, but I haven't required it so far, but yes, I do like to help you come up with, or, um, help direct or flesh out a topic so that it's not, so that it's not gr ground that's already well-traveled or, or traversed or um, cliche or too narrow or too broad or, you know, Okay. Thank you. Oh, no problem. Any other any other questions? And again, any other questions that you come up with or think of after this, after we hang up, or feel free to just send me an email. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, have a great week. And I will see you at this time next Thursday. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.